And so today, as you've heard, we are diving back into the messages that God proclaimed to um, Mary and Joseph. And now we're expanding that to the messages proclaimed not just by an angel, but by angels to these shepherds who were watching their sheep that wondrous night outside of Bethlehem. And so we've heard God exchange his messages with his people. And from those messages, we learn things about God. Now, these stories are familiar to all of us, I trust. And sometimes the familiar, we just glide by it. But we are, again, going to take some time to unpack what is there. What does it say? And then more importantly, what does it mean? And then how can these truths be applied to our lives? So go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at this interchange, this long-expected proclamation now that it's going to be expected expanded from this small group of people, Mary and Joseph, and then to Elizabeth, but now was expanded to shepherds and expanded beyond that circle into the town of Bethlehem. By the way, next week, we're going to look at the wise men and their um, interaction and their part of this story of God that is recorded for us in his word. So here we are, Luke chapter 2, starting with Verse 8, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. This wasn't just their place of employment, by the way. This is their residence that gave their life in a job that was not highly touted, okay? People did not want to grow up to be shepherds, right? This was something that was not looked upon highly because it was a difficult life. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, always on duty, living with the elements, living with these animals that were not always friendly or fun, that needed a lot of care. These shepherds, people that were often forgotten, rarely invited to social gatherings. Those people living out in the fields nearby Bethlehem. They were keeping watch over their flocks at night. This night for them was like any other night, but unlike every other night. They did not know what was going to happen. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And just like you or I, if we were there, they were terrified. Just a little note, by the way. Almost every time in Scripture... When an angel appears, the people are afraid. So don't fall for the little chubby angels in diapers playing harps. Not a good character of angels. Majestic, powerful. Glorious, and yes, sometimes disguised even in our day. The grace of God among us was announced by his messenger, not to the king in his palace, 
not even in the church or the synagogue, which is interesting to know. Not to the mayor of the town, not to the wealthy or the influential, but to the marginalized, the nearly forgotten, the faithful servants. They are the ones who received the phone call of God. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid because I bring you good news. And this good news, and I like this phrase, will cause great joy. Not just for you, but to all the people. That message in itself was fairly scandalous to Jewish ears. Because they thought that this long-awaited Messiah just for them. Yes, he was for them, but for all. This good news that was now proclaimed by these shepherds, proclaimed to these shepherds, would cause great joy for all people. And here is the news, verse 11. Today, in the town of David, that was fulfilling prophecy, by the way, from the Old Testament. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. You, to you, to you, to you. Don't miss the personalization of this message. He is the Messiah who is the Lord. So there's three names that we see here that were given. Three grand titles that were given to you. See them, Savior is the first. Second, Messiah. And the third name for this child who has just cleaned up and placenta removed completely vulnerable and dependent, this child is the Lord, Savior. The Savior has been born to you. Now, we have to ask ourselves, Saving us, how can this child save anything? And the bigger question is well, what do we need to be saved from? Now, at that time, the Jewish mentality was that this Messiah would save them from political oppression that they would be delivered from this invading, occupying, 
army and that mes- the Messiah, the Savior, would r- rise up, lead these people, destroy their enemies, and declare freedom for them. That, in their mind, was what they thought of when they thought of being saved. Often we, in our context, think Jesus' primary role is to free us from external difficulties and problems. God in his wisdom knew that yes, these external issues are issues, but they are secondary because the primary thing that we need to be saved from is our rebellion against God being captured by our fallen nature and its power and its penalty. That's the real issue. Because all of the external things will someday be over. You know why I can say that with 100% accuracy? Because someday you're going to be dead, right? It's going to be over at that point. However, there is eternity that has been placed in each one of our lives and your life is a whole lot longer than your time on this planet friend God help us to view our lives through the lens of eternity it puts things in perspective of a hundred thousand years from now, do you think it's going to matter that someone cut you off in the parking lot? Not going to matter. A hundred thousand years from now, you think you're really going to care that your candidate was or wasn't elected? You're in the metal spooner. I am, actually. Part of my job. To make sure that we're focused in on the right things. I'm glad I got a couple amens. Come on. This Savior was greater than just overthrowing a government, which Jesus could have done. Nothing for God to exchange or deliver in a moment. That's not hard for God. The real need was to save his people from their sin. We saw that message to Joseph. Why Jesus came. So this gift is a savior And I want you to make it personal today. For you. I'm grateful that every Sunday we have a time of prayer at nine and you're invited. I pray especially, God, forgive me of my sins. (laughs) Help me to get out of the way of me. Thank you for that grace. So there's a Savior given 
for me personally, for you personally, but extends beyond to the entire world, even to your cranky neighbor. even to the ends of the earth, a Savior has been born to you. This is the good news that brings great joy. The Messiah has been born to you. Not only is there salvation, but there's redemption. Saving us from our sins, but redeeming us and making us new. Giving us his spirit, replacing us. In our fallen nature, our tendency to do what we want to, to be arrogant, to be proud, to be angry, to be selfish, to be full of things of darkness. God gives us a new nature so that we can walk according to it. Now we all have to choose to say what side are we going to walk in, but God, by his grace, gives us his light so we can walk in truth and gives us a new spirit. Redemption, aren't you grateful for that? We don't have power over these things, but God does and gives us a new nature. The Messiah, the Redeemer, not just the Savior that keeps us from the penalty of our sin, but the Messiah who makes all things New. And then lastly, this is the Lord. This is the King. This is the Eternal One who has all authority in heaven and earth. And so when we come to Jesus, say, Well, I believe in Jesus. What does that mean? Well, I believe that he lived and died. Great. It's a good start. But who is he? Well, he's my Savior. Yes, he is your Savior. Thank him for that. But he's just not the Savior. He's the Messiah, the Restorer. He gives us what is new. But not just that, But also he's the Lord, the great king in which we serve and say, yes, I'll go to Ohio. Yes, I'll go to Africa. Yes, we'll stay in Rockford. Yes, I will give my life to you because you are the great eternal king whose government is on his shoulders and whose kingdom will never end. The prince of of peace, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty king. This is good news that causes joy, that things will change, that this loving Lord, this light to the world, the Savior of our sin is born to us. Don't lose sight of that message. These shepherds hearing it for the first time, terrified, Don't be scared. Let me tell you what's going on here. This is who this is. And shepherds to verify this in verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You'll know the one. This is who you're going to look for. You will find a baby. Wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. The only child lying in the manger that night was the savior of the world. What I'm saying to you, shepherds, this is how you're going to know that it's true. Go into town. You'll find a baby to be wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, a place where a child should not be, but yet there he would be. 
And after this announcement, like all of heaven was bursting with joy, like a three-year-old on Christmas, right? They're so excited to get their presents. Got to love kids at Christmas, amen, right? So excited. And it's like they couldn't hold it in any longer. And a great company. How many? I don't know. There's a lot of angels, right? A great company of angels. They had a angel was communicating to them. And then it's like the curtain of heaven was pulled back, right? The other dimension, they got a glimpse into it. Could you imagine that? And this stage, this curtain was open and suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with that angel. What were they doing? They were praising God. Praising God. God, thank you for this gift. God, thank you for your provision. God, thank you for this son. Dear Glory to God in the highest heaven and earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. God's favor <clears throat> gives us Peace. Doesn't our world long for peace? Don't you long for peace? Relational peace. Peace both vertical with God, peace horizontal with each other, peace nationally in our world. Have you noticed that our world really isn't really good at peace? We actually really stink at it. But this child who was born on earth, peace, now we have a way to be at peace with God because of Christ paying the penalty of our sin. We have God's favor. Peace now is capable with one another. That is no longer an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Grace, you. Grace that brings us peace. And on earth, peace to those whom his favor rests you know that if you believe the gospel, you have God's favor. If you hear the gospel, you have God's favor. Now, being favored by God does not mean everything will go perfect for you. I'm so glad to hear at least some response. Don't believe that garbage. There's a lot of of scriptures that talk about perseverance. You realize this? There's a lot of scripture that talk about grief, but doing it with hope. You and I are never guaranteed that it's going to be easy, but we are guaranteed that God will be with us. We're guaranteed that there's a newness of life. We're guaranteed that God hears our prayers and in his goodness is sovereign in his response. Are you hearing me? 
your favored, highly favored to hear the message of the gospel. There's over 2 billion people who have never heard this announcement that live on this planet this day. 2 billion. You can't even get your mind around that many people. God, help us to communicate like these shepherds. So God's peace comes with this grace. And so these shepherds heard this angel, heard this message, saw, witnessed this glorious, angelic proclamation. And then the angels left them, verse 15. Gone into heaven. Now the shepherd's probably in shock. What just happened? They had a little conversation. They had a little conference and they said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. (laughs) Which the Lord, which is interesting to think this baby communicated to them through these angels which the Lord has told us about. So, like you, like me, they gained the true perspective. They left, hurried off. Perhaps they ran or jogged. Maybe they're in good shape and they hoofed it about a mile or so, however far it was, to Bethlehem, not knowing where he was. All right, maybe they all split up. Okay, Bob and Jacob go this way, and Larry and Dan go this way, and let's spread out. And they could have easily, they skipped all the houses, right? They went out back to the barns, the places where the animals were kept, and they looked around, and maybe someone said, I found him! I don't know how they communicated because they didn't have cell phones. But they figured it out. So they hurry off and they found Mary and Joseph. And the baby. Yep. It was lying in the manger. And when... Seen him, verified these things. What'd they do? They spread the word. They spread the word for what they were told about this child. Catch that. They were talking about this child. Yes, they communicated surely about how it was communicated, but it wasn't how it was communicated that mattered. It was about what was communicated that was mattered. It's about this child. And all who heard it were amazed. What? No, no, tell me that again. What happened? And all of you saw this? And he was actually lying in the manger? So the truth is that God's story is passed on through our lives. 
Now, can God send angels to communicate his message to people this day and in our day? The answer to that question is yes. And he does this. But you know how God's message is primarily communicated? Right. Through your mouth. Now, these angels could have appeared over all of Bethlehem. These angels could have appeared to Jerusalem, the major city. They could have shown up there, right? They could have shown up in Bethlehem. It would have made the shepherd's job a little easier, per se, and people would have believed them. Why did they show up to these forgotten people outside of town and just a few of them because God invited them to be a part of the story, to communicate the message. Guess what, shepherds? You've heard this story as well. This Christmas, how do you think the story of Christmas is going to be communicated? Are you waiting for an angel or the angel on top of the tree just to animate and say, sit down, y'all? God in his sovereignty chooses to use us just like these shepherds to communicate this message. God, help us to seize opportunities. Someone say amen right here. A lot of us are going to get together with friends and family. Some are going to know and believe this message. Most probably will know something, but all we're asked to do is to be a witness of what we've seen and heard. Do you hear me? God, help us with this. God's story is passed on through our lives. Verse 19 But Mary treasured up. What a great word. (laughs) Treasured up these things. Thought about them. Pondered them. In the storeroom of her heart. Treasured them. Treasured words and memories, moments he treasured. These things. I hope we treasure these things as well, greater than any iPhone or new computer or car or pair of socks you're getting this Christmas. Treasure these things in her heart. Treasure. And then, after this event, shepherds went back to being shepherds. <laughs> they return. As they return, they glorified and praised God. For all the things they have heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And this may be an odd point, but the one that struck me for the first time while reading this story, and I've read it a lot, This declaration of the exact identity of this child, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord, was somehow forgotten. Dave, what do you mean by this? We have it in the Bible. Yeah, we do. It was remembered in that way. I had the privilege of uh, preaching 
through the Gospel of Mark. And especially in the Gospel of Mark, the question about the identity of Jesus was pondered and asked. You would think, and maybe if I was there, I would say, that's the Messiah, and I would have like tattooed a big M on his head. That's the Messiah. But somehow from his birth right, until his ministry years, 30 years ago, somehow that message of who this was was muddied or forgotten or lost because they didn't know who this was from the kings to the religious experts that even his own family How does that happen? How do we forget things? In a commentary that I read this last week, he said this sentence, which I like, and he noted the same thing. He says, we have a short remembrance of extraordinary extraordinary events which have no immediate consequences. That's a handful. I'm going to say it one more time. We have a short remembrance of extraordinary, extra, no, extraordinary events. Easy for you to say. We have a short remembrance of extraordinary events We don't remember them that have no immediate consequences. Where is the message of Christmas that we focus on today? May 19th. Where is it in August 24th? Where is it? On April 3rd. We celebrate it, and if you look back into your life, all of us at some point have had God interject the message of hope, of salvation, of resurrection, of transformation in our history, but often we forget it when we're facing something that scares us or is bigger than us. Here's the point. Remember the message of Christmas. We remember it. We repeat these things. Why? We bring it back to our mind. We bring it back to our mind. We bring it back to our mind. Because just like writing in the sand at a beach, that over time the message fades away because of the, 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 inter, the uh, let's see, the waves of our, of our day, Right? And just the waves coming through and this erasing by grain of sand, by grain of sand, the, the message. And it has to be rewritten and re-imprinted. So we remember. So I want us to remember the message of the birth of the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. Yes, during this season we remember But remember the next time you're in the hospital. Remember the next time that your tire goes flat. Remember the next time where there's some sort of pain or difficulty or discouragement. Or disappointment. Remember that there's still a Savior. There's still a Messiah. There's still a Lord. There's still hope. There's still peace. And that everything will be made new. 
joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let us be the Christmas people all the time. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Glory to God in the highest. So remember, we put up the nativity scenes to remember. Remember the story. Remember what God said. Remember these things all year round. So I'm grateful for Christmas. 